This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of world-class software like PDF Pen for Mac, PDF Pen Pro for Mac, PDF Pen for iPhone and iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander for Mac, and Text Expander for iPhone and iPad. Learn more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, it's only taken about two months to get uh, our guest and myself together to do this show because I've I've been anxious to do it simply because this is about a piece of software that I use for every single post on Mac Voices, for every single post on the Mug Center, and pretty much for every single post I do um, at the office to our websites there. That software is Mars Edit, and we have the developer, Daniel Jalkett, here to tell us all about the new version. Daniel, it's good to see you again. Thanks for being good here. Good to see you again. I love hearing that. Uh, I love hearing about people talking about every post being posted with Mars Edit. It feels great to hear about uh, real world you know, utility happening. Well, it's right here it is, boy, because That's I tell excellent. you what, it, yeah. it has made my life so much easier. As, as, as great as WordPress is, it's still so much more convenient to be able to compose things offline with you know all the traditional Mac editing tools and all, and then have them uploaded, uploaded, and especially uploaded with very clean code. That's the part I love about Mars Edit. Mm-hmm. Well, that's why we're Mac users. You know, we care about the we care about those little things. And it also means that when you have clean code, should you have to migrate or make changes, you don't have to deal with all that other garbage. Because I, right. before I started using Mars, Mars Edit, I'm not sure if it was before Mars Edit existed, but before I started using Mars Edit, I was using something else, and I had a nightmare of code to clean up. So mm, okay, I'm glad that hasn't happened with Mars Edit. So. No, no. So th- thank you very much for, <laughs> yeah. for for all your help in what I do. Sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on the show again. It's been a while too. It's been a while to set, set this up, and I think it's been couple years at least since i was on last time but yeah. uh time just you goes. know time flies when you're when you're having fun and making podcasts <laughs> yeah. and making great software and <laughs> oh, making great right. software. Yeah. so you well not now but about a, a month and a half ago two months ago you brought out a new version of mars edit and that was the, the when we started the discussion about trying to get our schedules together and i just i wanted to to ask you to come on and remind people about what mars edit is and then talk about some of the new features and and what the future is for mars edit sure yeah well, mars edit the way i usually go back to describing it is the way the original developer of the app 13 14 years ago now uh, described it to me when I acquired it, which was, he said, it was Brent Simmons, uh, famous Brent Simmons of uh, NetNewsWire and other projects. Um, and he described it as being, um, his design vision, I think from the beginning, was to make an app that was like mail on the Mac, but that you could use to send a blog post to your blog. So you, you get on mail on the Mac, everybody knows, you make a new message, you write who it's going to, and you press send. And little funny things in Mars Edit exist because of that initial um, inspiration. For example, in Mars Edit, to send a post to your blog, it's very familiar to anybody who writes mail in, in mail.app because it's Command Shift D, uh, the keyboard shortcut. Uh, so there's little things like that where you know in Mars Edit the idea is basically you set up your blog accounts as many as you want. Same way you can set up as many email accounts as you want. Um, so you know I have a, a, a WordPress blog personal blog. I have a a professional red sweater blog. I have kind of a cheeky blog from 10 years ago that I will host on Blogger. And and I have them all listed. I have my my podcast, Core Intuition. All of them are listed in Mars Edit. When I want to go add something to any of them, just as if I were going to mail, I just go to Mars Edit, say new post, uh, select which blog it's going to, give it a title, give it some content, Command Shift D in my case, of course, you can click the button if you're more visually oriented, and it goes up to your blog. And that's the high level. That's the thing that makes it sound like it's so simple you could never need to add any new features. <laughs> um, I kind of like kind of like that about when there's when there's an app that uh, you can interpret it from the very simple like, well, what else does it need level? Uh, but then, of course, as you dig into it, and as you know, Chuck, using the app, I'm sure you have used many of the features, and you probably have ideas for adding features to it. Um, and that is has been common uh, over the now, it's been 11 years that I've been developing the app. Um, I acquired the app from my friend Brent uh, when it was at just 
I think it was just 1.1. And now this was a uh, 4.0 released in December, 2017. Um, this was a long time coming. This app, this release took way longer than I expected. Um, part of that was down to some personal things in my life. I had a couple kids, uh, bought a house, uh, you know, things happen outside of work as well. Um, but also it was due to things like Apple introducing all new, uh, sandboxing, uh, technologies for the Mac app store. I wanted to stay in the Mac app store. So I decided to embrace that and, and sort of, you know, re rejigger Mars edit to suit that. Uh, so a lot of the work in Mars edit four is actually related to that. But unfortunately that's the stuff you can't really put on the marketing list and say, Hooray! It has all this internal infrastructure that's been redone to accommodate Apple's, you know, seem semi-capricious changes of whim. You know, um, so I spent a lot more time looking at what the big feedback was over the ten years since I've been in charge of the app. And this Mars Edit Four release is, um, I would say, it's sort of, even though it has some things that you might. But I see as kind of big. It's more of a kind of like uh, there's a little something for everybody in there. And um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sort of glancing to the side here to remind myself some of the th I sometimes forget all the new stuff that's gone in here. But, um, you know, a lot of people have complained over the years. Um, you know, Mac users, like we said earlier, they're very particular and the finer finer points of many different things make an impact. And. Um, you often hear this criticism. It doesn't take too long for this criticism to arise for any app, which is, it looks like it's five years old or 10 years old or 15 years old, whatever it is. Um, as apps, especially these old, like long standing apps that we love, as they get older, of course, they start to look a little nuancedly different than the modern stuff. And so uh, one of the things I wanted to do with Mars Edit 4 was give it a little fresh coat of paint. Um, and it's really fascinating. It's not that different from Mars Edit 3, but some of the fundamentals like the icons in the main window changing, uh, new icon, beautiful new icon, um, and it's um, the icon by Brad Ellis, by the way, who's a wonderful designer. Um, and the icons in the app for that matter. Um, anyway, that was a nice thing. That kind of gives something to the people who are like, okay, we like the way this functions, but we're tired of looking at this old interface. Um, there's a whole other swath of features that I added in for that are specifically for WordPress users. So you'll like that stuff. Um, it's it's faster at refreshing WordPress blogs. There's a new functionality, um, not just for WordPress, but significantly for WordPress that it can for most blogs now, download the entire archive of your past posts. So used to be limited um, by limitations in the API for WordPress, the, the, the thing that Mars Edit connects to. Uh, so there's some things in there where it's frustrations that not every user ran into, but when they did run into it, it was something they wanted to let me know about. And as I look over this, I'm just breathing a little sigh of relief, thinking, oh, I'm never going to get that customer support email for that particular thing <laughs> again. Um, you know, another big thing, uh, like I said earlier, there's uh, I use the command uh, shortcuts a lot, keyboard shortcuts. So it's not top on my list to have like a visual button bar for things like making bolds and under, you know, uh, italics and all that stuff. And I don't even use the toolbar buttons much myself. I just use, you know, keyboard shortcuts to open up my media window, everything. Um, but... I get this feedback from users who there's a lot of people out there. I'm sure some of the folks watching this podcast, they prefer a visual interface. They prefer to see a button, click it. Um, and so I, I started down that road with Mars Edit 4 by finally adding a sort of visual formatting bar for those things like alignment, um, editing the, like I said, the bold italics, et cetera. Um, we'll see how that evolves going forward. I'm going to talk all day, Chuck. I guess if you if you let me. But. <laughs> well, I, I I think there are a couple of things here that you've said that I think are really interesting. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's this sounds like the classic example of a developer who is developing a tool for himself because he uses it to do other things, and I'm, I'm I imagine it's kind of hard for you to prioritize things that don't fit in with the way you use the the application. And yet you're right. There are a lot of us that would like 
maybe more visual things or different features. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's always the thing that the feature that I want is the most important. You know, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, it's true. And as a, um, as these kinds of you know the, the the classically described like scratch your own itch app, right? Um, these kinds of apps they can be wonderful in the sense that when you have a developer who's passionately engaged in using the app, you know that the app is going to continue to see some progress. And but you don't know whether all that progress is going to be focused exclusively on the things that matter to that developer. So I think there is a, a balance to strike. Um, and I've been, you know, balancing these things since I started developing the app. Um, one of the main, one of the main things to know about Mars edit for folks who haven't used it is, um, it has two modes of editing. It has a rich text editing mode, which is more suited to people who never want to see, um, HTML or markdown code. They just want to, you know, make the font, what size it is, type see the bolds, see the links, et cetera. And then it has a plain text mode, which is suitable for writing in HTML, markdown, potentially any other plain text format that you want to. Um, and to be honest, I prefer as a user the plain text mode. And so it's been something for me to try to keep my mind on what the rich text folks are looking for. Um, and that's a great example of where I think if I was exclusively focused on features I care about, then the app would not have a rich text editing mode. So it's interesting in that sense that I think the rich text editing is one of the best features of the app, to be honest. And I think it's one of the things that probably makes my customer base most happy to use the app, even though it's not something I use. So there's a little bit of a mix of that scratch your own itch and you know, the other kind of app you see out there is something where somebody just, you know, notices a need in the world and creates something to, to satisfy that need, even though they don't particularly need it. Um, you know, you might, if you were a developer who invented a new way to manage um, banking operations, but you didn't run a bank, that would be a good example of that. Like, completely outside of your own interest as far as like utility, but you might still be fascinated with the problem domain. And I, I think that the fact that you offer a rich text mode is what differentiates it from some other options that are out there. Um, there because there are a, no, a number of good HTML editors or code editors. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet, if you are intimidated by that, or if you don't quite know, you know you want the, these two words to be a link. And so if I do this and click that button and paste the URL in, it does it in the background. Yep. But the fact that you then let me toggle back and forth so quickly and easily lets me, first of all, see the code and manipulate it if I know how, but almost mm -hmm. more importantly, learn something about how the code is structured and, and what it takes to create a hyperlink. And, and that, uh -huh. yeah. I, I love that fact. It also lets me take code from anywhere else, uh, say from another program, and yep. put it in and not have to do all the retyping or re-editing re of, of all the links and everything. I just go go to that plain text mode, paste it in, go back to rich text, and all of a sudden it's it's perfect. Yeah. I mean, it's great for folks who who like to straddle both sides of the of editing modes, too. Um, and that's, you know, to be honest... Um, I mostly don't use rich text, but sometimes I do see something that looks like it would be easier to do in rich text mode. So I switch over to rich text and make my changes and switch back. Now, the, the caveat there is that whenever you go through that switch, there might be some subtle changes to the formatting of the plain text. So it's more uh, more of a caveat for plain text, um, tidy plain text editing folks. But I try to keep things as as neat as possible. Yeah. It may if you're if you're doing it in plain text, it may be good to just toggle it back and forth once or twice just to be sure. But you know, that's yeah. the number of times I've had to make changes any of any significant nature are minimal if if at best. Uh -huh. That's at best. good. Yeah. At best. Um so one thing I do want to make sure we touch on because I as strange as this sounds, I get questions about this uh, about Mars Edit from time to time, and that is, and you you kind of opened the door for me earlier. Um, you mentioned that you have one of your blogs hosted on Blogger. Um, mm -hmm. Why doesn't Square? Why doesn't Mars Edit support Squarespace? Oh, big breath there. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it's hard for me to believe um, it's been so many years since Mars Edit did support Squarespace. Um, to be honest, it's been this trajectory from – so long story short, Mars Edit and Squarespace worked together well uh, as of Squarespace version 5, which I think now is probably about six years old or something, seven maybe. It's pretty old. Um, so I used to consider Squarespace a first-class uh, system to support on Mars Edit. And it wasn't through any choice of my own. Uh, uh, it was a Squarespace decision in Mars Edit and Squarespace 6, I think, where they, um, you know, to their credit and to the benefit of their customers, they totally redid the way that their own web-based editor works. works. And I think a lot of their customers appreciate and benefit from that. But in the process of doing that, they made um, the strategic decision that they would no longer support a public API, which is like, I, I used that term before. The API is an interface for connecting one piece of software to another. And uh, so in that process, they effectively made it impossible for any third-party app to um, to fully integrate with Squarespace. So if you look at Squarespace, Squarespace's proposal uh, to users about how it's best used, it's all about making a really easy web-based, browser-based editing interface. And I think they achieve that. Uh, and then they also stress the ability to, for technical people to sort of enhance the baseline functionality by embedding and, and doing their own programming on the Squarespace site in JavaScript. Um, but none of that uh, affords an app like Mars Edit connecting to the service and editing posts and downloading posts. And um, for that reason, um, you know, early on, and I, at first I thought it was just going to be a growing pain and they were going to realize, oh, yeah, the, people really want this uh, API, so we better get that back into order. But I think that they just decided not to prioritize it. And I, what started out for me as a, um, a you know, optimistic uh, um, assumption that it would eventually come back has now become more or less um, convinced in totality um, determination that they won't support an API. Um, that the caveat there, of course, is, you know, um, it's possible apps like Mars Edit will become so popular that services that have dropped APIs will be inspired to add them again. Um, it's hard for me to say whether that will happen, but you know, that's the, the little sliver of um, optimism on that front is based in that. Um, but on the other hand, while, while Squarespace has dropped their API support, um, other companies like Blogger, like WordPress, ha have really enhanced and, and um, improved their API, sometimes so fast and with such gusto that it's hard for me to, to keep up. I'm, I'm thinking particularly about WordPress in that sense. Um, and I think WordPress has an attitude about the web. Um, WordPress, both automatic, the, the corporate sort of wing of WordPress, and WordPress.org, the completely open source wing of WordPress, they both seem to really embrace the idea um, that the web is sort of like a toolkit of components from which everybody should be able to build the solution that works for them. And so I have very high confidence that, um, for example, WordPress would never – I hope I don't ever eat my words here – WordPress would never – drop the kind of support for third-party integration that they have now. And I think that it benefits them. You know, they use they use the uh, API that Mars Edit uses. They use the same API in their iOS and Android apps. Um, so there's a lot of uh, value for these companies to make an API that satisfies both their own needs while also opening up their system to to other people like myself, like other blog, blog uh, app developers to be able to really enhance the service, you know? And it, under the heading of full disclosure, Squarespace has been a sponsor of the show. Um, I still have the Mac Voices blog on a Squarespace site. Um, I do remember that when they made that change over, uh, there was quite a bit of controversy even with dedicated Squarespace users mm -hmm. um, because it, there were some things that got broken, some things that had to be redone. But I do think it came out the other side as, as a terrific product. It's just not mm -hmm. one that interfaces with Mars Edit. Right. WordPress also is a great product. It does interface with Mars Edit. And it seems like the, the, the WordPress philosophy 
um, the whole community is built around that contributing and everybody can kind of plug in to it. Yes. So I would be surprised if you had to eat your words. No, and in fact, I mean, WordPress impresses me all the time. The uh, I think a lot of it comes from Matt Mullenweg, the company founder, from his personal philosophy, um, which is so open source oriented. And he is so open source oriented that, you know, to be honest, his philosophy and mine differ a lot in, in some of the particulars there. But he seems to have a very confident sense that what his company can offer is unique and valuable separate from a lot of the, um, like I said, the components that go into that. And so, for example, even a lot of the stuff that makes WordPress.com special and unique and differentiated from WordPress.org, the open source product, they actually make that, um, you probably know this, they make a lot of that functionality available for free in the form of a Jetpack plugin, which is effectively their like special sauce, so to speak, from WordPress.com put into an open format that anybody can use. I really have a lot of, I have, you know, I, I hope I came across, I think I came across the the right way with Squarespace, which is I have a lot of respect for them. And I'm so impressed with what they've done. And, as, you know, if you look at the story of Squarespace, it was like started by this kid, with like a $10,000 loan from his dad. And look at what they've done. It's just um, whatever the core values are of each company differ in a way that WordPress is I'm so confident in recommending WordPress specifically to people who are concerned about having kind of control of the components going forward. And I do think um, there are ways, significant ways that Squarespace is a better choice for people in some of the ways that they make it just easier to put everything together right in the website. Um, but uh, there's a reason that, you know, and I, I love this stuff because um Personally, I've I've been saying for years now. I wish we had like ten times the competitors to Mars Edit that we have now, and I wish we had ten times the competitors to Squarespace and and WordPress and Blogger and Tumblr. There's a bunch of them. There are there are a bunch, but um, I wish I don't mind, and I and I think that um, this whole like web blogging community can has so many particular tastes. It's kind of like the um, text editor market. Like there's so many particular tastes. You can have a BB edit and a text mate and a, uh, you know, by word, I writer. You can have a, a hundred of those and all of them can make a living because there's so many individual tastes and so many niche problems to be solved uniquely for a certain subset of people. I I've, I've really respect you for that because it's, it's so easy to say, well, this is best or that's best. And I struggle with that all the time because we're all looking for the best, yeah, whatever right, that means. Yeah. And you, you kind of forget that, okay, these might be the very best shoes, except that they're three sizes too small for me. You yeah. know, so I have to make a, a compromise. In this case, you're not, not making compromises, you're making choices. And and I'm with you. I, I recommend Squarespace to people. I recommend WordPress to people mm -hmm. because I think that depending on what you're – what your skill level is and what you're going to do with it, they, they're both great fits. But if, you, if you're recommending WordPress, I think you also have to recommend Mars Edit mm, for I like folks. That. <laughs> well, really, and I'm, I'm not just yeah. saying that because you're here, because right. the, 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 the editor in, in WordPress is, is great, um, but there's, the, there's a convenience oh. factor that maybe I can't always be mm -hmm. online, which is increasingly a strange idea. No, right. But you know, it, it's, it's fact that there are a lot of times... I mean, if I get on a plane who, that doesn't have internet, I can still compose web posts or, or do work on my website with Mars Edit. If I'm using any of the other options, eh, not so yeah. much. Well, and that's uh, that's the tip of the iceberg. Like, and for me, part of the challenge in develop, developing, you, know, you talked a little bit like where does Mars Edit go in the future? Um, again, a lot of people look at Mars Edit 4 and they think, well, it looks like it's done. Like, what else do you have to do? There's nothing left to do. And... Um, what I like to look at is what are the ways that Mars that already is unique because it's a Mac app and what are the ways it continue can continue to differentiate itself by being a Mac app. So you mentioned like the being offline, you know, strictly speaking, web apps can kind of do that. And some of them can these days. Um, but there's also other stuff in Mars that people who get used to the Mac really value like, um, there's the fact that the the um, you know all the standard web you know text editing 
command keys and shortcuts typically works. The things that you expect to work like, you know, a lot of this will work in a web browser, but, um, uh, you know, the way the spell checking works, the way the undo stuff works, um, people expect it to work the same in Mars edit as it works in other apps on their Mac. And, uh, you know, down to everything, like the way the buttons click, how do you click a button? How do you click a radio button? Well, those of us who are old time Mac users know that you can click the button circle or you can click the text and not everybody who makes a web app agrees with that convention. Um, you know, uh, another example of a Mac app having an advantage over a web app is Mars edit has like a direct tie into photos on your Mac. So, um, if you want to add stuff from your photos library, from Apple photos library, for, for that matter, from aperture or, um, Lightroom, you just bring up the media manager and all your photos are there from all those apps and that kind of thing. I don't even know if that's possible yet on a, a web app. I don't think it is. Uh, so I need to, as a developer, I need to look now going forward. Um, what are the things that are either extremely hard for web developers to do or impossible and which may be anything ranging from very easy for me to do on the Mac to at least moderately, you know, moderately difficult and really tackle those things. Cause those are the things when it comes down to it. Um, you know, I'm looking at my list here. One of the examples, um, is, um, just by being on your Mac, Mars Edit 4 offers a button that you can make appear in Safari that goes right, right, right up in your toolbar. And you click that button, and whatever page you're looking at in Safari becomes the basis for a new draft in Mars Edit. Like, this is great for people with link blogs like Daring Fireball, where they want to be able to quickly go browsing on the web and make a bunch of new draft posts in Mars Edit. Um, you know, strictly speaking, there's probably browser plugins you can install to get that kind of functionality in, in WordPress uh, online. But that's a great example where just by being a native app, you have possibilities open up to you that are not available for web apps. So. Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile at smilesoftware.com, the makers of world-class software for the Mac and iOS. PDF Pen by Smile is the one PDF utility you really need. In fact, PDF Pen is the only PDF utility you need. Why do you need a PDF utility? Just look at your Mac or your iPhone or your iPad. Check your email attachments. Everything comes to you in PDF format now because it isn't editable. Except that with PDF Pen, you can edit your PDFs, which makes them even more useful. But that's just where it starts. With PDF Pen, you can mark up your PDF documents just like on paper. Highlight text, draw on your PDF, even write notes and comments. Suddenly, handling your PDFs isn't a hassle, it's a pleasure. Sometimes, though, that's just not enough. PDF Pen can let you run optical character recognition on your PDFs to turn them back into text so it can be copied and moved to other programs as you wish, for whatever use you have. Or, use those features to search for what you're looking for and redact what you don't want seen. And this is no cover-up kind of redact. This is secure redacting so that no one is going to see what's hidden. PDF Pen can help you add, delete, or combine pages so that multiple documents become one or one document becomes multiple. Or you can insert images or remove them if you wish. You can even add file and audio attachments to your PDF documents. I said that PDF Pen is the only PDF utility you will ever need, and that's true, unless you want to do more. Then you need PDF Pen Pro, which adds the ability to create and edit forms, turn whole websites into PDFs, create and edit tables of contents, create links from URLs, and even create PDF portfolios. If you count your iPhone and iPad in your productivity arsenal, Smile has you covered there too with PDF Pen for iPad and iPhone that delivers the most used features of the desktop version to iOS. Sign and fill out forms, edit pages, add passwords, and much more. There are so many features to the PDF Pen family of software that you really need to check it out for yourself and find out what it can do for you to make your life easier and more productive. To find that out, all you have to do is visit smilesoftware.com and download a free trial. Open a PDF, annotate it, edit it, redact it. Once you have a taste of that power, you're not going to want to go back to just reading PDFs. That's PDF Pen and PDF Pen Pro from Smile 
the makers of world-class software. Visit them at smilesoftware.com and check out everything they have to offer to help you do more. Thanks to Smile for their support of Mac Voices. And another thing about Mars that it is, at least to my eye, is it's very much a Mac app for, for a lot of the reasons you just said, but also it doesn't try to reinvent interfaces. It, I mean, you, by the nature of it, you've probably had to make a couple tweaks because of its very specific use. Mm -hmm. But it, it's a, it feels like a Mac app through and through, and that may, therefore it's approachable. As soon as I open it up, I feel like I kind of know where to get started or how to get started. And that, that's really important when I recommend it to someone as mm -hmm. this is one of the ways that you want to learn how to edit your blog. And that's one of the things that as old timers from the Mac, we really appreciate about not just the Mac, but any native platform that has a consistent set of guidelines for what the user interface should be like. And I think we're at kind of a cusp right now of something. We'll see how history plays out. Um, the iOS um, user interfaces are kind of a medium, like a, a in between ground between the Mac, kind of like having a really strong identity and a rigid like sense of what how controls should look and how they should behave. Um, and then the web is just free for all, wild west still of any kind of interface, inter any kind of interaction you want, uh, any kind of font standards, any kind of you know animation should a should a um a web page when you scroll to the bottom just keep adding new content should it you know change to a whole new window whatever any of that's up in the air on the web and then on ios it's sort of a little bit of a balance where you can have some apps that really try to stick to the ios standard guidelines and some that think you know i think there's a sense on ios that you have to kind of like establish your own custom look and some of that as you said, it does come back to the Mac. Some app developers on the Mac, frankly, spend a lot of extra time making their apps not look like like in the way that you describe Mars Edit as approachable, the way they might describe it as boring or you know undifferentiated, right? And so it's kind of like we all deal with these things in 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 our daily lives. Like you know, if you go to use a faucet. And you expect the hot water on one side and the cold water on the other side. If somebody just willy nilly starts mixing that up, you could think of that as annoying, or you could think of that as unique and differentiating. <laughs> um, and and I think for a lot of us on the Mac, it's like, you know, fine, make the faucet look fancy, give it a bronze neck, make the handles marble or whatever, but make the fundamentals behave the way we expect. And that's sort of a dividing line for a lot of us between what's okay to customize and make unique and sort of splash splash up, dress up, and what just has to behave the way that it's always behaved on the Mac in order to just frustrate, you know, to in order not to not frustrate people. And I try to keep that in mind a lot. The one thing that you haven't said about about that, and I love the the faucet example. That's a perfect one. I want to steal that. Okay. Um, <laughs> But the idea that there, so many of these applications have learning curves, and if you can find a way to cut down on the learning curve of an app, you stand a much better chance of success. Mm -hmm. And so I, I understand the idea that you want it to look unique and you want it to look cool, and that's great. But if I have to go through and learn the process of, you know, how do I make text bold? I mean, if there's some extra special incantation or a button that doesn't look at all like a, a bold button, then right. That's that's a couple extra minutes and one more thing I have to remember, and therefore I might be tempted to go back to what I'm familiar with or explore other options. So mm -hmm. I I, th I think your 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 points are so well taken. That's just one piece I want to add in for developers yep. out there that might be thinking about well how do I differentiate myself? Differentiate yourself by making it familiar and easy to use and easy to learn. Absolutely, and you know um, that's sort of a. a on the one hand, making yourself very different kind of has an advantage that it, the, the users that you do attract and you do get to learn your peculiarities, they're more likely maybe to feel kind of locked in because they know how to use your special software and they might feel like that's now the appropriate way to, to use all software of that kind. But on the other hand, the more sort of standard 
developers are, the more that they respect the conventions, it allows people to easily sort of port into their app. You know, like um, there was another Mac app for a long time that was pretty popular, another Mac blog editor called Ecto. And we were dramatically different in some fundamental ways. But some things worked exactly the same. You could command in to create a new post and you could click a send button to publish it to your blog. You know, a lot of, I mean, I, I, and that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. My, my point being, even though we were different, had different philosophies, it was pretty easy for a Mars Edit user to go try out Ecto and for an Ecto user to go try out Mars Edit and use the same skill set and the same philosophical sort of like the same um, mental model of how you edit blog posts and publish them to the web. And if either of us had been dramatically like defying defiant of the system standards, then you, you would have gone from one to the other and, and been like, I don't know what to make of this. Um, and I just think there's something that's respectful of the users to say, you know, I feel the same way about systems that um, are very good about supporting export and import of data. Right. So some some small-minded people would think you don't want to support exporting data. You only want to support importing data because you want new users to come into your app. You don't want users to leave your app. But um, the fact is supporting a, a, a world where people can freely jump between things actually makes users more trusting of developers and more willing to – it may, yes, indeed, make it easier for somebody to go step outside and try something else. Um, but then the fact that you offered that ability to easily leave and return will make them that much more trusting of you, I think, when they come back. I'm going on a very philosophical bent here. <laughs> no, I, I think we both are, but I think yeah. I think I, I sort of expected this from you, um, yeah. the philosophical bent. But I, I think that this is really important because we're speaking to developers, we're speaking to, uh, to end users about the things that they need to consider when they are going to purchase an app. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm with you completely on that. I've, in fact, in the past, and certainly... Uh, not the distant past necessarily, but I've made some bad choices f about apps that would not let me. They'd let me put plenty of data in, but then getting it back out is a whole other matter. And so now that has become one of my mantras that I want to see how you let me get it in, but I want to see how you let me get it out. Not even necessarily to leave your app and move to something else, but to mm -hmm. take my data and use it maybe in a different way or in a different program. But yeah, that... That means I'm working with my data, with your program, not leaving you. Right. You know, it's interesting. Just talking about this, I feel like I should add a caveat, which is, as it happens, Mars Edit doesn't have an export functionality per se. Um, and it makes me think, just like saying what I just said, you know, what does that mean? What does that project? I think the reason it doesn't is because the vast majority of most of the data people work with, with Mars Edit is published to a system. And so the the idea is basically you know the 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 version of export import portability with Mars edit is that it in, engages with another repository of your data. So it's connecting up to your WordPress blog. And it is easy to leave Mars edit and go to Ecto for instance in the old days or something now like Blogo or uh, even Byword uh, has um, some blogging functionality. Um, it's easy to go try those things out, and your data is, you know, is there. Um, but it's kind of interesting just to say it out loud so forcefully makes me think like, you know, hey, um, you know, I could probably do a little bit better on that front myself. Yeah, but how would you? I, I, M mainly for yeah, yeah, mainly for when I mainly. Um, this is a little bit of a confusing thing about Mars Edit that I know you understand, Chuck, but a lot of new users takes a little while to get the distinction between Mars Edit's local drafts and published stuff on the web. And so the local drafts are posts that you've written and have not committed to publishing anywhere yet. And you can write as many as you want in Mars Edit and save them, and they're saved in your home folder in Mars Edit's custom data folder. And... Um, they are there in fairly open, accessible format, 
but they're in a property list format that you might need a custom app to to um, process. And so it would be nice if there was some way to say export those. I don't know. I'm I'm kind of picking picking nits here, but um, there's some data in there that could be nice to support as an export. I mean, you can always copy and paste it out too, of course. But um, yeah, that's and and I'm not giving you a pass on this. But yeah. I, I never really thought about it as as something that I needed to export to anywhere except to my website because it, outside of just the, the the needing the HTML or the the code right. for something yeah. else, and and I mean, how many other places am I going to use that? I guess yeah, in right. theory there might be some because I do have other applications that I will bring. Yeah, I guess so. I will bring that HTML into. Um, into Mars Edit, so mm -hmm. I. But usually that's by cut and paste. So if I were going to take something out of Mar out of Mars Edit, that's how I would do it: cut and paste. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's a fairly contrived example for most people. But if, if for instance, you spent three months writing a 20, 20 posts on a blog that you had never published anywhere, and then you decided actually this great app Mars Edit that I've been using for three months, I don't want to use anymore. Uh, then you might want to export those posts in a way that you could keep working on them in another app. But like you say, in more typical cases, you would have published those 20 posts over the course of those three months. You wouldn't be sitting on them. Uh, and there would be, no, therefore, no need to export them. In, in a way, my website might become the intermediary between Mars Edit and something else. It's true. And in fact, I usually recommend to people, um, actually, a lot of the blog systems have great like I said, export and import functionality. So um, people ask me sometimes, like, "Hey, can I use Mars Edit to go to take my my blog from WordPress or from one WordPress to another?" Is the most canonical example. And in that case, I always say, "No, please don't, because you're going to get the best experience by going to WordPress and using their export and then their import, and you get everything." You know, because Mars Edit works with most of the details of your blog, but it doesn't work with absolutely everything it doesn't do anything with comments for example right. um and i don't know what all what all they, they export and import but the point is like there are tools that are better for that um but it's kind of it's kind of a um compliment that people jump to the desire to use mars edit to do it but i often have to say no no this in this case please don't use mars edit please use a better tool for that for that particular use one and I'm pretty sure I'm not going to embarrass myself here. I think it was Mars Edit Four that you added the ability to upload the featured image along with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yes. when that popped up, it's like, oh, I love this because that's a, that's a good example. Yeah, before I was, you know, okay, I can upload my post, but then I always had to visit the website and you know click the featured link and hook it up or featured image, excuse me, hook it up. Yep. And that was that was a, a, an excellent excellent addition. And I wondered if there was a reason that it hadn't been done before, because it's as the web became more and more visual, it seemed like such an, an obvious thing. Yeah, it didn't mean that I couldn't embed images into into uh, into Mars Edit before. Yeah, I just couldn't upload them automatically. Yeah, it's just one of those things. Uh, a few reasons. Um, one of the reasons it I mentioned earlier, it's kind of hard for me to keep up with all the changes on the different blog systems and the APIs. So. Featured image support is one of many things that WordPress has added over the years. Uh, another thing I added in Mars Edit 4 is the ability to select a post kind. Um, so, like, you can say whether, you know, WordPress sort of added this Tumblr-like attribute of posts. So, you can say this is a photo post or this is a, um, a quotation and things like that. So... That's another example. Um, there are other things that have changed, like for instance, the ability to download the whole whole history of the blog. That was another thing that was um, inspired by changes in WordPress. Um, so as you can imagine, this list just sort of goes. Everything uh, on there goes on the list of like this would be nice to add. And um, there are other things that, if you had a different focus on blogging, you would think even now, like why why the heck hasn't he added that, you know? Um, so that's the one thing is there's just a kind of like a huge list of things that can be added. And there's a prior, uh, the challenge of prioritizing those, even with things that if you look at them through a certain lens, it seems like the most obvious thing in the world to support. Um, the second thing is a lot of these things, 
they make they they're made to look so simple on the face of it. Um, just a field in Mars Edit where you drop an image, and there's a a lot of things to consider infrastructurally in the app to try to make that work better. And to be honest, it's not 100% perfect now. I'm glad it's working really well for a lot of people. But um, just to give you a sense of it, like it works really well right now to drag an image into the featured image well and then say, okay, there's my image. I'm good to go. Publish it. And what some things that don't work as well are um, – for instance, um, if you drag an image into the main post and then you decide, oh, I actually want that to be my featured image as well. I'm not sure dragging from the main post to the featured image works yet. And a lot of this boils down to, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of stumbling on explaining it, but something that seems simple, the, the infrastructure behind that is basically to have this idea of like an image as an entity that you can reference from all these different parts of the program and have them share the same image instead of like uploading two images. And this is, this is sweating the details, but the naive way to do that would be to upload two images. And one of them is the featured image, and one of them is the content image, and they both just happen to be the same exact image. And when you try to sweat the details, you want to avoid that kind of situation. So you want to say, how do I rework this app so that the concept of images lets me share one image upload it once, use it in the body of the post and as the featured image. And then further complicating things, a feature I'm hoping to add to Mars Edit soon, and it's not there yet, but it's another one of those isn't this obvious features, is um, what if I uploaded the image through the web and added it you know, to a, to a post? Maybe it's even another post. And what if I want to use that image as my featured image in Mars Edit? Um, you should be able to say, Hey, I know I have this image in my blog somewhere. I want to use that. And, um, this is an area where I have to be honest, the, um, for this specific workflow, some of the things you can do on the web interface to WordPress are better suited to how you can work with it in Mars edit. And I mean, obviously that was true before I added any support for featured images at all, but some of that um, some of the problems there are so, sort of more based on infrastructural reworkings that need to happen in Mars Edit. So sometimes when you look at something in any app, including Mars Edit, but all the apps that we all know and love, from a developer's point of view, it's easier to assume sometimes that the reason something hasn't happened isn't because you know the developer disagrees that it would be useful or or that they are lazy, or that they don't care about their app. Sometimes it's um, more like, I can't do this feature well until I do, I can't do this 10% work that will make this feature and do it well until I do this 90% work that revamps the way something else was done in my app. So that's the that's the long and, long and hairy explanation. And I would think in the case of, of the images, it does make a little more sense. I'm not sure that's the right phrase. It it it's understandable why it would work better as a web app, because your website WordPress is looking at the images stored on the server. Right. As, well, uh, it has direct access to everything. Right. Whereas Mars Edit is always working with some form of a cached representation of everything, um, and that's part of what makes the the offline functionality work, um, like, like you mentioned, but. Uh, yeah, Mars Edit, everything you do on the web, the, one of the reasons web apps are typically slower is because they're constantly accessing all the database information, you know, supporting the web app and all that jazz. And and one of the reasons that desktop apps are typically faster is because they're just dealing with stuff that's right there on the computer. Um, and the the design compromise for, for Mars Edit, at least, is not to behave like a web app that is constantly going to the web server every time it needs to find out what's available. Um, but instead to try to download and cache as much as it can, keep it on your Mac so that you can access it. Um, so there's a there's a sort of a balance to strike. Ideally, what Mars Edit would do is have all that stuff cached and ready to go and also be prepared to go out to the web at any moment if it's connected and get an updated version of what you're working with. But would that mean that you also have to 
you would either have to archive all the images that, that I've uploaded through Mars Edit, and also, gee, check, uh, check my website to see if I added one directly and then pull it down into the Mars Edit archive so it's available. And that, would, yep. that would balloon storage requirements, and especially for anyone who has a, a well, in, in, as you said, a photo blog. I mean, yeah, that, that, I mean, that's a compromise I'm going to have to I'm going to have to deal with when I add this feature, because to be honest, as much as you as much as you describe that accurately as a, a risk or a challenge, that's like the dream and the goal for other people who expect to have a verbatim copy of their entire blog on their Mac. Right. right? So it's probably something that I'll end up accommodating somehow as um as, a, as an option, I could see, for example, saying um, when you download all your photos from your blog, um, just download a thumbnail thumbnail sized image of everything, or, or download the original. Uh, something like that could could work. But this is a great example of something that kind of sounds simple becomes complicated when you when you weigh the balance, you know, balance the trade offs one way or the other. Daniel, every time we talk. I'm I'm so impressed with the philosophical part of it. With I think you used the phrase earlier, sweating the details, and and I feel like I want to say, kids, if you're watching this, <laughs> this this is the kind of developer you want to be. You know, it, it would have been real easy, and that was my first solution when I thought when you were descri describing it. Okay, well, I just upload two copies of the image and be mm -hmm. done with it, and that that is wasteful and it's not elegant. It's not the Macintosh way, um, mm -hmm. and and I know that sounds a little hokey, but it's it's true, you know. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to develop a, a, a truly elegant piece of software, and now I'm going to go back uh, to, to using my Mac, and I'm going to be looking at some inelegant software that I'm forced mm -hmm. to use and growl a little mm -hmm. bit because I wish every developer took the care you did or mm -hmm. do. And thank you so much. That's very nice to hear. I mean, we there's there's just different personality types in the world and some people do sweat the details more than others. I would also say, you know, there are things in my app that I find personally frustrating and I sometimes wish I wish I had sweated the details a little more in that area, but I think um, it's good. It's good to find a balance. It's good to be mindful of what the consequences of every choice are. And sometimes, to be honest, I say, you know what? I'm kind of going down a little bit too much of a perfectionist route with that. <laughs> um, and in fact, with that um, featured image support that I added for Mars Edit Four, I literally at one point had to say to myself. Um, you know, 99% of people out there just want to be able to drag an image in here and have it be the featured image and upload their post. And I am punishing them by not finishing this feature and shipping it in order to ostensibly save the 1% of people who are going to be frustrated by this nuanced this nuanced shortcoming. Um, and I have to kind of remind myself of that a lot because the good side of that sweating the details is really pushing oneself to try to get it right and to try to make it so that when you're done, it looks simple and it looks like something that was easy to do, but it, it looks that way because you don't notice any of the problems. That's the good side. And the bad side is um, never getting the features out, never finishing the stuff. And you know, I look to Apple for motivation, inspiration a lot, and I think a lot of the criticisms people have about Apple – boil down to some of those same values slash challenges. And like a good example to my mind is Siri. Like everybody kind of loves some things about Siri and really hates some things about Siri. And if I look at Siri, I think there's a lot of things in there that probably don't exist because Apple doesn't want to do them until they can get them right. And that's a very common Apple attitude. And it's very satisfying when Apple finally gets something right and releases it. But it's very frustrating when they sit on something, maybe, that we all might be able to just like suck it up and enjoy, but they're waiting to get something right, and we sometimes wish they would just you know, compromise and ship something. And I, 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 I struggle with that myself, and I think that's a healthy place. You know, As you said, kids who are watching, yes, be a little bit like me. Um, <laughs> be a little bit like somebody who just says, 
I'm going to just wing it and ship this and see how it goes. I, I can't help but piggyback on that. It's it's yeah. a little bit like the security issues uh, that that Apple is taking such care of with Siri, and the some of the other devices don't seem to be taking as much care. Maybe because they have different agendas behind the scenes, but they don't take as much care. And so as a result, um, at least one friend of ours uh, refers to the some of the other devices as wiretaps, and mm. you know. Siri, not not as much. In fact, not mm -hmm. at all. So yeah, it's it, agenda priorities. Yeah, all those things have to have to factor in. But mm -hmm. I, yeah, you're again another great example with Siri is that I I I want it to to work right, and I expect that from Apple. Right. And so maybe I just have to be a little more patient. Yeah, I think so. And you know, just I'll just say one other thing, which is. Um, about this whole question of like, why don't things work the way that we expect them to? I always just have to remind myself, and I think a lot of our listeners today can relate to this. It's like, think of the little list, think of the list of like to-do items you have around your house. Um, for me, it's like things like, oh, I've got like a broken rain gutter on one corner of my house. And I've got some like tile in my shower that needs to be re grouted. And these are all little things that should quote unquote should be easy. Um, but the, as you said, the priority lists, the prioritizations of what you do on any given day, I think all of us have things on our lists that we would be kind of embarrassed if somebody pointed out, out to us how long it's been since we intended to do them. And yet nonetheless, uh, they remain undone. And so just from like a point of empathy, I would say like, remember that all the things that uh, any developer from somebody's independent solo like me all the way up to a huge company with hundreds of thousands of employees like Apple, they are all just like dealing with a version of having that stupid little chore that they're supposed to do, but they can't seem to get around to doing so it's, I think, a good metaphor to keep in mind for the from the um, empathizing point of view. I, I can't relate at all. I'm on top of everything. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I'd be doubly embarrassed at, at the list of things I need to get done. So I want to make sure we we take the time to tell folks where to go and get Mars Edit, where they can learn more, and also definitely where to find you on the web because you're you're one of those outspoken voices in the community about a lot of things, and I'm hoping that this discussion intrigues people enough to go and follow you and pay attention to some of it because I think you mm -hmm. have you have an attitude that we need to foster more of in the community. Thank you very much for saying that. Um, the high level way to keep up with me is probably through my Twitter, um, which is a little bit rude, but it's my first name, Daniel, and then punk ass. So Daniel, P-U-N-K-A-S-S. -S. Um, that's kind of kind of like where you'll see the most of my personality. So, you know, that's high level. Maybe don't go there if you don't want to see political rants and <laughs> et cetera. Um, you can also, though, just if you want to keep up with me just on a strictly business level, um, red-sweater.com is the um is the red sweater homepage i keep that more or less just strictly business um i also have a, a, a tech blog i see this is when you have a blog editing app you just like you don't shy away from making all the blogs <laughs> so i have a tech tech blog um called bitsplitting.org bit splitting like you're trying to split a bit um and that'll be good for folks who want to like keep up with my um, thoughts about just general tech stuff. Um, and if you like what I've been talking about here with Chuck, as far as like philosophical programmery stuff, uh, I, may, I, I do a, a non tech, mostly non technical podcast called Core Intuition with my friend Manton Reese, and um, we basically sit around once a week and talk about the challenges, the triumphs the frustrations from Apple, our takes on the latest Apple news. Um, and you can catch up with us there at coreint.org. Excellent. And of course, at redsweater.com is where you go to get Mars Edit. And if I remember correctly, there's a free version, a free demo version to download. Absolutely. Yeah, you can, um, with this, one of the things I didn't mention about Mars Edit 4 is I actually made the same proposition for downloading a free trial 
and buying the app and even um, getting an upgrade price purchase available both on my site, redsweater.com slash store and in the Mac app store. So um, as it stands now, you can do, you can go to either one, whichever you prefer. And if you download the app on my store, it's just automatically in a two week trial period from the moment you launch it. Um, if you go to the Mac app store, it's very similar. It's just the way that the mechanics of the app store work. You have to go into the in-app purchase window and it'll pop up actually when you first launch it. And, um, you just have to quote unquote buy a free trial. Um, and that's free. So you, it's just the mechanics of the store, but, um, feel free to check it out. I hope you do whichever way you choose to do it. Um, and uh, like Chuck said, it's you know it's a it's a great app for the native folks who love native Mac experiences. That's who I would recommend this most to, and give it a try. Or if you know somebody who might appreciate that, I really appreciate passing the word along. And I can certainly, as I said at the top of the show, I can heartily endorse it because I use it pretty much every day for multiple different websites and blogs, and it it always it's never let me down. Awesome. I love to hear that. And I hope I'll be hearing that soon from some of our listeners today. And uh, thanks so much for having me on the show. Hey, Daniel, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm just sorry it took us so long to get together, but I think it was well worth the wait. Yes. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make it a, we'll make it a, maybe a shorter uh, delay until the next time I come back and tell you about, maybe I'll tell you about Mars Edit 5 in fewer than seven years. I'm, I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. Okay. <laughs> thanks so much. All right. Thanks. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. Again, check out Red Sweater Software and Mars Edit uh, if you have any interest in editing your blogs offline or maybe just making them easier to access because it is absolutely the, the gold standard as far as I'm concerned. Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Mac Voices Facebook group and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us at patreon.com slash macvoices and join these folks who help keep Mac Voices coming to you. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. <laughs>